If you love walking through the bush, as I do, you will learn very early on which weeds are dominating our native bushland. Cape broom and English broom are two species that have asserted their presence in our native and agricultural landscapes. Hi, I'm Jess from the Adelaide and Mount Lofty Ranges Natural Resources Management Board. Today we're going to take a look at Cape broom and English broom. Broom is native to Europe and was introduced to Australia in the early 1800s. It is a declared weed under the Natural Resources Management Act. This means that all people are prohibited from moving or selling broom and have a legal responsibility to control it on their properties. Cape broom and English broom are non-spiny woody shrubs that grow up to three metres tall. They can be identified by their yellow pea-like flowers and their clover-like leaves. Cape broom and English broom can be distinguished from one another as English broom has five-sided branches and stems, whereas Cape broom has ridged stems, not five-sided. English broom has short hairs on the lower surface of the seed pods, and Cape broom has dense hairy seed pods. Broom is similar in appearance to native species, such as Pultanea daphnoides but Pultanea has waxy leaves and a yellow flower with red markings. Its leaves are not divided into three leaflets and the seed pods are not hairy. Be sure to properly identify broom before implementing control. Once established, broom plants will start flowering in their second or third year and will mainly flower between September and December. The seeds are shed mostly during January to March. Mature plants may live for 25 years or more. Cape and English broom is a major threat to native vegetation. Infestations left unchecked, like this one, can grow to form dense stands, shading out native vegetation, such as small grasses and herbs, and eucalypt seedlings. Brooms can also reduce available grazing land in pasture situations, if left unmanaged. Like controlling most weeds, broom control requires long-term commitment. Control programs may be more effective if a combination of different methods are used for controlling infestations. Broom species have a shallow root, which makes them ideal for hand pulling smaller plants. I'm going to demonstrate hand pulling this smaller one here. Broom species about this size might be easier to use a tree popper or a mattock. Follow the stem to the ground. Pinch the stem on both sides with your fingers and simply lev leverage it out or pull up. As you can see, when the soil is moist, the roots come away without snapping off. As mentioned earlier, a tree popper can be a weed controller's favourite tool for manual removal of broom plants from waist to shoulder high, such as this one here. The way to go about it is take the tree popper. As you do, the jaw opens up. Slide it over the stem down at ground level. As you lean back on the lever, the jaw closes, pull back, and the plant should come away cleanly. As you can see here, that was quite a successful removal. With all the roots coming away, having more soil makes it a lot easier. Following that, it's really important to pat the soil back into place to prevent other weed seeds from germinating and also to prevent erosion. 
We can also manually remove broom with a mattock, such as this one. First thing is establish where the stem is going into the ground. Make sure you have a clear swing. Hit just out in front of the plant. Once or twice might be required. Roll the mattock back, flicking the roots up and pull. As you can see, that was quite an easy and successful removal and that got out roots and all. It's best to do this method before the seed has set. If you remove the plant when the seed is present, the action of removal will disperse the seed into the disturbed soil and may lead to other weeds and more broom germinating. So make sure to pat any soil back into place and monitor the site regularly for weed growth. Herbicide can be used to control broom. Spot spraying can be used on broom infestations, either small right through to larger infestations. The larger the infestation, the more strategic you need to be in planning your spraying such as prioritising the application of chemical to the least heavily infested areas and working through to the most heavily infested areas. When handling chemicals, always follow the label directions and wear the correct personal protective equipment for the task at hand. When applying the herbicide, spray the leaves and along the length of the stems. Care must be given when spraying, ensuring desirable species such as native vegetation is not sprayed. If you're unsure, seek professional advice. Adding a marker dye, like Andy has here, to the spray mixture will help you to see where you have sprayed and where you need to spray. A good time to apply chemical is after a fire. As a fire may stimulate the bulk of seeds within the seed bank to germinate. Applying herbicide after germination will control the emerging seedlings and the best part of future seed sources. The cut and swab method may be most appropriate where desirable species are present and where the use of herbicides and soil disturbance is not preferable. Using a cutting implement such as secateurs, loppers, for larger plants and for larger again a handsaw or perhaps even a chainsaw. We cut the plant off at the ground level. First we clear around the base to establish where the bottom of the stem is going into the ground. Take our implement, make a clean cut as low as we can and apply the herbicide within 20 seconds of making the cut. It is important to remove where possible the cut material or store elsewhere off native vegetation to encourage natural generation and prevent smothering of native plants. Prior to seed set, slashing or mulching can prevent seeding and reduce the biomass of the infestation, helping to prepare the site for future herbicide application. Slashing and mulching will not give full control of infestations. So follow-up control on regrowth is essential. This method helps reduce the amount of herbicide needed to control an infestation as the bulk of the plant has been removed and only regrowth is sprayed. Damage to native vegetation can be avoided when skilled machine operators work around desirable species, leaving them unharmed. Grazing with sheep can be effective in preventing plants establishing in pasture situations. Grazing livestock is not appropriate for bushland settings, as the animals will also graze on and damage native vegetation. There has been some work done with the release of biological control agents in Australia for the control of both Cape and English broom. Currently in the Adelaide and Mount Lofty Ranges region, a number of control agents are present. 
However, the impact they are having is minimal. Hopefully in the future, we can talk more about biological control and how successful it has been for Broome. For more information about biological control, contact the Adelaide and Mount Lofty Rangers Natural Resources Management Board.